Praise the Lord. <laughs> the youth had a great night. Uh, on Friday night, they were out at uh, Medford, or, or uh, Eugene, and just had a powerful time there. And uh, just excited just to see what's going on around the house, all over the place. Praise the Lord. Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans 5. I'm going to be talking about the new you this morning. And I uh, just want to honor the grads as well. But what a great group of uh, young men and women. Uh, have, have been with us the last number of years and just really appreciate each one of them. And it's great to have their parents with us today as well. Praise the Lord. All right. I, what, what I want to do this morning is I want to look at two pictures that are contrasting pictures. Um, each, each one of them is a contrasting picture of who we were and who we are as, as believers. And what well, I want to look at this morning is out of Romans 5. And uh, this chapter, uh, we're going to do a little bird's eye view on this. And we're going to look at th through a phrase that is, it's through Jesus, through Jesus. And so I want to read uh, right off the bat, I'm going to read three scriptures. And then we're going to get into it. Okay, Romans 5, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then Romans 5.11, which acts as a break in this um, passage or this chapter. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received uh, the reconciliation. And then uh, Romans 5.21, which ends the chapter, it says, So that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we got this preposition through, and it has the idea of being like a channel or a portal or a doorway to, and it's through uh, Jesus Christ. And it's leading to a completion. It's a, a process of time going th through the, those areas. And um, in Romans 5, 1 and 2, let me read it again. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, Anytime uh, you, you think of uh, family adoption and uh, people being brought into a family, um, whether that be a young, I'm not so much thinking of a baby, but I'm thinking of an older person being brought into a family, being adopted by, their, uh, by a family, uh, sometimes there is a mindset that begins to come into uh, the child is, uh, you know, wondering, hey, what was, was I abandoned? What, what were the reasons that I was left? And then also the neglect or the rejection of thoughts that might come into that child's mindset. And um, the, the have, they might have questions like, do, the, do these individuals, do these people uh, really love me? Do they really, 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 do they really uh, want me? Do they want me in their, their family? And they, they battle that. And on the same token, uh, there is a, in the spiritual way, uh, there is a way that we think in as believers. And I, I think there's at times we each go in, in through that rhythm, does God really want us? You know, does God really love me? You know, the way I am and just uh, my ups and my downs of who I am, does God really care about me and love me? I just don't feel good enough. I just don't feel like I can be good enough. And that's where uh, we get into this uh, verse here and where he says, hey, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And th this, is, this is a loaded term, the word justified. And it, it, it was a legal term and a legal sense that it was being uh, brought across. And it had the idea of somebody was in court, there was judgments that were against them, they were going to be condemned, and in the court, that person is pardoned. They're completely, all of those things, judgments that were against them are legally removed from that person. And for, for, for each and every one of us, that's the area of sin. It's, it's the area, hey, there's things that you 
and I have done. There's things that we have thought. There's things that we have behaved in certain patterns. And we, we've said, hey, you know, I don't deserve anything. I am guilty. Well, in the court of law, what's happened through Jesus and through his blood is he has taken care of that judgment that was against us once and for all. We have been completely, fully, totally, completely uh, pardoned through Jesus Christ, through having a relationship with Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. It just keeps on moving. And th this goes from here, being justified by faith, it, it goes where we're now acquitted and made right and declared innocent. It moves to a place now where it goes into, you are now adopted into a family. And it carries the idea that you're brought into a loving, caring family. And the idea is that you are now made a child of God. Now think about that for a second. In the, the legal courts of heaven, when we accept Jesus Christ, all of those things, those things that were written against you, all the bad that you have done in your life, all of those things are removed, but it doesn't stop there. You are now made a child of God. And that not only are you made a child of God, no, you are brought into the king of kings home. You are now part of the royal family. All right. Now, everybody, take your left hand, go like this, okay? Now, do the royal wave for me, okay? All right, good. We are, we are children of the, the Most High God uh, through the work of Jesus Christ, and we're brought into uh, His grace. Uh, and it, it's not just, hey, we're just not given an audience with the king. It's not just for a moment. Oh, I, I, I saw, like a few years ago, I was in Denmark, and I saw the royal heir to the throne jump, jumping on a yacht, and it's like, oh, I saw. What, what happens to us when we receive Jesus into our life, we are brought permanently into the royal residence of grace. We are brought into all of the favor, the blessings, the promises, all of those things. We are now co-heirs with the Lord. Everything that belongs to, hit to the Lord now belongs to us because we are now a part of the family of God. And th these, aren't, these aren't just promises. They are exceedingly great and precious promises, but also they are a fact. It is an established thing that has been accomplished and done through uh, Jesus Christ. But it, I want to hit uh, two things today. And one is, uh, the first one here is the acceptance in his love. And let me just read here now. In Romans uh, 5, 6, and 11, it reads these words. It says, when, for when we were still sin, with, excuse me, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps a good man, some would even dare to die. Maybe there's somebody in this room here you would die for, you know? Maybe there isn't somebody. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, everybody say much more. Then having now been justified by his blood, and remember that word justified, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, everybody say the word, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received uh, the reconciliation. And so we, we see this for this phrase that keeps on reoccurring here is we were, we were, we were, we were without strength. You know, it's like we, we didn't have the ability to save ourselves. Uh, we were still sinners. We doing our own thing and just away from the Lord. We disobeyed. We were, we, we were enemies. We were uh, antagonistically opposing God. But then we read these words, and these are such great and awesome words. And everybody should have these words underlined in their Bible because they are just fantastic. They're, I used to have a guy when I was preaching, um, 
uh, back in the day when I was a youth pastor, and I was preaching on Sunday nights, and this one man would be sitting in the second row, and when I'd hit a point, he'd go, fantastic, you know, and I just appreciated that, brother. Once in a while, he would just let it loose. He'd just go, fantastic, you know, and this verse right here in Romans 5, 8 is Fantastic, okay? You got, you got it, okay? So Romans 5, 8, this, uh, here's what it says. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, what a verse. This is, this is one of the most beautiful scriptures in all of the Bible. And it just wants, it wants to show the extent of God's love that he has for you and me. Hey, when you were out there and you didn't know where you were going, okay? When you were out there with the partying party crowd and uh, you're just m raising bad situations, when you were doing things you knew you shouldn't have been doing, hey, Christ had already died for you. You know, when you were in rebellion, when you were in that, that uh, Hell's Angel gang people, when you were doing whatever you were doing, God still had sacrificed himself on the cross for you. When, the, the, when you were in complete hostility, when you were opposing the Lord, even said, I do not want to have a thing to do with the Lord. Jesus had died for you. When you were still, Christ died for you. He decided to demonstrate his love for each and every one of us. Wow, you know, I think of a peacock, and you know that male peacock, it gets its feathers out, right? And it just goes around the, the, the female peacock, you know? He wants to strut his stuff and show, hey, I, I, I want to demonstrate who I am. And they, you know, they, I think of men and women, you know, when they, they start courting one another and they start like dating each other and, and they just flirt with each other. They want to show the best who they are. Well, God demonstrated himself or fully displayed himself of what kind of love he had when he died on a cross. When he sacrificed himself, he says, hey, you want to see what I'm really like? You really want to see what my love is like for you and for you and for you and for you? This is what my love is like. And he spreads himself on a cross on our, beh on our behalf, dying for your sin and my sin. He demonstrated his love for us. While we will yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, how many, come on people, how many think the love of God is wonderful? You know, come on. You know, it's, I, I look at 1 John 3, 1. It says th these words, another beautiful verse. You need to, everybody say fantastic, okay? Fantastic, okay, you're, you're there. Okay, 1 John 3, 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason that the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And here's another one in Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. For God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. And he, when he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. You know, God wants to, he, he wants to take out the doubts in your mind that you are loved by God. There is an enduring, forward, without quitting, persistent, lavish, unmerited, undeserved, overwhelming, completely cascading over your life. There is an over surplus of his love that just wants to shower every thought. If, if I could do something for every person, I would love just to baptize our brains and just say, hey, you are loved by God. You are loved by the Lord. It, there's an old hymn, you know, that's, uh, 
uh, over 100 years, years old, is called The Love of God. And it goes this way. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angel song. You know, the, oh, the wonderful love of God. You know, in verse 11, he says, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. It is through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received the reconciliation. Why did Jesus come? Why did he come? You know, we think about that, and most people would say, he came to forgive our sins. And that is absolutely true. He did come to, to do that. But that was just a means to an end. That was not his ultimate goal. Jesus' ultimate goal was to bring us into right relationship with him. He wanted us to experience what's called the reconciliation. What we mean by the reconciliation is the uniting of harmony of relationship between him and you. That is what he wanted for each and every one of us. His, his cry, his draw, his pull on our life is that he wants to bring us into that harmony and united of, of, life, uh, of a relationship with him. Jesus said, I have come for you that you might have life and life what? More abundantly for you. He, they're, they're in the fullness of time, Jesus came that you might have fullness of life. And that you might have fullness of life, and that not only fullness of life, that you would have fullness of joy. God wants to fill your life and my life with a lot of joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. The more we can just get into that zone where we say, God, I am just going to rest and be secure in your love for my life, you know, it actually takes off a lot of the depression. It removes a lot of the, you know, just the, the worry that floods our heart. All of a sudden, there comes a, a spirit of rest upon our hearts and our spirit. Because why? Because we are being soaked in his love. That, that we have an understanding of his abundance, abundant love. Every, everybody say, I'm accepted in God's love. I'm accepted in God's love. All right, here's the second one uh, this morning, is a significance of his grace. And the, the second comparison is, is concerning uh, two atoms, the two atoms spelled A-D-A-M-S, not atoms, okay? And uh, call on each of us to reign over sin. So Romans 5, 12, and I'm just going to read partially some of these verses, um, and it says, therefore, just through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sin. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through that one, much more those who receive abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So what happened is that in Romans, what it gives you a picture is it parallels two people alongside. The first Adam and then picture of Jesus, who's a picture of the second Adam, or the, the last Adam. And that, that's the parallel that is drawn, and it's the contrast that is given. In Genesis 1.26, Adam was given authority. He was given what was known as the dominion mandate. He was to take dominion, subdue the earth, and he was to, to walk in an authority upon the face of the earth. 
but he abdicated that power when he gave in to sin. And upon that moment, sin entered into the human race. Adam's name actually means humanity. It represents, he was the representation of humanity at that point on his failure and his frailty and his weakness, the sin began to disseminate throughout all the world. And where that sin entered into the world, then it, it contaminated whole, all of humanity and then it ultimately leads to death and destruction. We've all have sinned and come shout of the glory. Whether we've accepted Adam's nature and also his example in our life and ultimately it has led to sin. Well, in complete contrast to that is the picture of Jesus and Jesus coming on the face of the earth and he, he given himself and on it. And so just a second here, just let's think about the first Adam for a second. You know, Karen and I, uh, the other night, we watched a movie and it was called The Mayor of Castor Bridge, okay? And it, it's a British PBS movie and uh, so we're beginning to watch this movie and the on those old movies, they'd always start with the credits at the beginning. And Karen sees, oh, the, the guy that wrote, wrote this book is a guy by the name of Thomas Hardy. And Karen says, when I was a teenager, I read some of Thomas Hardy's books. And, he's, he's, and she says, all of them are depressing. All, all of them are just depressing. Nevertheless, we watched this movie, okay? And uh, so we're watching the movie, and it has ups and downs and all throughout, and, you know, the protagonist has ups and downs, and finally, at the end, the protagonist has a lonesome, depressing death, okay? And that's how the movie ends. So, spoiler alert, okay, for all, for all you guys that are into that movie right there, okay? Well, well that's, sort of, that's sort of how it goes with the Adamic nature. If you, you just stick with the Adamic nature, okay, the nature of Adam, okay, the first Adam, if you go that way and you say, oh, sin, sin's depressing, Sin, man, gets me into all bad things. All, all, it, it brings, hey, my life doesn't glorify God the way it should, and ultimately it leads into ruin and destruction, and finally it leads into death. There's, a, there's this propensity that is working in, in my life to, to do different things in who we are that has uh, bent towards doing our own thing and doing what we don't know. We know something we're not supposed to do that, but we do it anyways. And we, uh, we do what we shouldn't do, and we don't do what we're supposed to do, and we come short in pleasing God and glorifying God. Why? Because the, in the Adamic nature, sin reigns. Okay, let me quote Forrest Gump, okay? Stupid is, stupid does, okay? Let me rephrase that. Sin is, sin does, okay? That, that there needs to be a nature change, a nature change, and how is that possible? What, 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 when, when one man fails in God's purposes, God raises up another man. Like, for example, when Moses, he lost his temper, all God says, hey, you're not going to take the children of Israel into the promised land. And so he raises up Joshua. Joshua takes the children of Israel into the promised land. When Saul failed, King Saul failed, the Lord says, hey, I am going to raise up someone better, even your neighbor. When he failed on the purpose of God, God raises somebody up. But how do you change uh, somebody like Adam, how do you change and come into a new humanity? And that is the question. How do you replace Adam? And then you come to this phrase, through Jesus. That is the preposition, through Jesus. The free gift came to all men, resulting in life. Okay? Scripture verse, we all know. Most of us would know, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new what? 
creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new, are becoming new. There, there is that whole end of there. And in verse 21, we read these words. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who is going to reign? Okay? Who is going to reign? Take a look at that. That, that grace might reign. Okay? In the, the same manner that sin was the driving force in your life, at this point in Jesus, now grace is the driving force of your new nature. Grace is this, people. Grace is the favor of God, and it is a, the force of God in our life. It is the favor, it is in the sense of, hey, we completely don't deserve it. It is undeserved, it's unmerited. All of a sudden, God lavishly pours out his love and blessings on our life, and he just slaps it on there. It is the favor, we don't deserve that. There's, there's not one person in this room who deserves the favor of God in their life, but for some reason, some way, God has pointed his finger at you, and chosen you. That is the favor of God. But as well, it is a force in your life in the sense it is the divine enablement or empowerment of God to do which, that which pleases God, to honor God with your, your life. Grace is God's license to you to destroy sin in your life. The grace of God is what does it. it. It breaks that power and that hold, that grasp of sin that would, that, that would hang over your life. Grace needs to reign in our life. See, we can get these mindsets in, in our life. Okay? Oh, I, I'm a sinner. You know, I, I'm, I'm bound my, by my sin and all the bad things. I'm only going to sin again and again. Poor me, you know, it's hopeless, it's useless, that addiction has the best of me. Well, that attitude, I will never overcome that attitude in my life. That fear that I wrestle with in my mind. Okay, people, we need to change our thinking. We need to change our stinking thinking, okay? We need to come to a place where we at this point would say, I am a child of God. I am born again. I'm not born of an earthly seed. I'm born of an incorruptible seed, even the seed of Christ. That is at work within me. The power of God's grace is there. And I'm not born, I am born of the last Adam, not the old Adam. And his grace works in me in the innermost. Okay, now I want to say a phrase, and I want us all to say it. Sin may remain, but it no longer reigns. Okay? Everybody just say that. Sin may remain, but it no longer reigns. Okay? So what, where grace reigns in our life, sin wanes in our life. Do we understand that? Where grace reigns in our life, sin wanes in our life. It's not, shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? The, the answer to that is, God forbid that I should do that. But as grace, as the divine working of God within me is still working and growing in my life, grace of God reigning in me, it is causing me to do what is right through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's working in me so I will fully glorify God in all I do. To the, to the degree grace is reigning in your life, it is going to cause there to be an explosion even of joy in your life because of the desire in the, of, of your heart. Even though, okay, do we fully get rid of that sin nature? Okay, there is a gravitational pull of sin upon our life. Satan is still tempting us. 
There are spiritual forces that we are dealing with in this age. We battle those. But as we call on and rely upon the grace of God in our life, there is an abundance of grace that begins to go to work so we can overcome and, and be victorious over those places of sin in our life. Somebody give me a fantastic, okay? <laughs> you know, I, I, I am not held by the, the, the sin nature any longer. You know, that's those chains that were there. And it's like, oh, I got to do what I got to do. Sin does what it is. It, it is what it does. It's flowing out. Of, I, I'm not held by those things anymore. It, it, right now, I, I experience through Jesus Christ. I experience his life. I experience his joy. I experience his power working in me to do what pleases and honors him and glorifies God and fills me with a joy and a gladness that is everlasting. That is what the presence of God does in our hearts. Well... <laughs> God's given us a doorway. That doorway is through Jesus Christ. It really is. We walk through that door. We experience him. Maybe you're dealing with an addiction in this room right now. I, and say, well, I'm always this. Like Alcohol Anonymous says, hey, you're always hey, going to be an alcoholic or whatever. I'm an alcoholic, blah, blah, blah. No, you are a saint, people. If you've got a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, he can break those ties and those holds and those bondages that are on your life. You are a child of God. You are a victorious son of the Most High God. There is a liberty that only Jesus can give. Let's say we're going on a hike all together, and uh, that'd be kind of strange, but anyways, we'd all go on a hike, and we're, we're doing that, and we got our backpack, we got our food, and it's a heavy load. You know, you got maybe 15, 20 pounds of food in the back of your backpack, and you get to where you're gonna have your lunch, you eat that lunch, and you drink your drink, whatever you, you got, your coconut milk, you drink, you drink that, I hate coconut milk, okay? <laughs> okay. And you, you drink that, you not only lighten your load, you don't only lighten your load, you, you receive the energy that you've had by eating that food. And that is what the grace of God is like in our life. It's like we're carrying a weight, a burden. I'm trying to do it. And God says, hey, it's time to eat your lunch. There's a supply of grace for your life that's going to lighten the load off of your life it's going to give you the energy. It's going to give you the strength. It's like when we read the Bible, grace comes to us. All the writer, Paul, when he's writing, he starts his letters with grace to you. And he finishes letters, grace be with you. Why does he do that? Because everything in between there is food for your soul. There's grace for you to receive by reading the word of God. You know, when we come to, in our prayer times and worship times, hey, I come to the throne of grace, and I get help, and I get grace for my time of need. That There's a divine supply that I need. I need to partake of that in my life. When we come to the table of the Lord, it is a table of grace. It's like, Lord, I thank you for dying on the cross. Lord, I, even as I take the bread... Right now, I am receiving supernatural strength and energy that only you can give through Jesus Christ to my life. When we gather together as, as saints into the house of grace, everyone encouraging one another, everyone loving on each other, hey, grace, grace, grace to my soul. Every one of us need to feed on that. There are such demonic, ugly forces that are trying to bring us down. But God in Christ Jesus has provided through Jesus, through Jesus, an acceptance in his love, a significance of his grace. Everybody said, I mean, let's have the musicians come. 
Amen. Let's stand, everybody. It's an honor to have everybody here today from near and far. Praise the Lord. Those on live stream, God bless you today. I want to pray for you today. Um, first, I'm going to pray. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You, you'd say, hey, Pastor Jeff, I've been doing my own thing. Um, you know, I've been a rebellion, you know, but hey, today, I want Jesus to forgive me of, of all my wrongdoing, all my sin. I need to get right with God today. This is your opportunity. And the Holy Spirit right now would be speaking to your heart. And if that's you, just acknowledge by the raising of your hand and just say, Pastor Jeff, I, I need to get right with the Lord. I need to ask Jesus into my life from this day forward. That's you. Anyone? Feel free to raise that hand right now. All right. I want to ask this question today, too. I want to ask, maybe you're here today, and you just say, Pastor Jeff, I've just been trying to do it on in my own strength, my own energy, my own willpower. Pastor Jeff, I really need to begin to tap into the grace that is, that is given to me. I really need to tap on into God's power, his empowerment, his enablement, his ability working in me. I need to do that more. Quit trusting more, less in myself, more in the what God is doing inside of me. I need to depend more fully on the grace of God in your life. Would you just raise your hand right now? Excellent, excellent. Here we go to pray. Father, I just pray for everyone here. I just pray right now just an impartation into our hearts and lives, Lord, our mindsets, Lord, first of all. Lord, that we would just be baptized in your love, Lord, and also in your grace, Lord, in our mind, minds. I just pray, Lord, that that would just infiltrate, penetrate completely into our hearts and lives. Lord, and I just pray an impartation of that grace into the hearts of your people, Lord, even as we humble ourselves, say, Lord, we need more of you in our life. We need more of you. Lord, I just pray, fill every heart and every life in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen. Musicians.